I think for now we will get started as I don't want to keep you all too long and um, from hearing what Greg has to say so I'm just going to share my screen with you shortly and um, just very quickly there we go you should all be able to see my screen at the moment there we go my powerpoint has been somewhat slow today but we all know the trials and tribulations of using um a technology especially on a Wednesday so Again, welcome, welcome one and all to our Stadler Teacher Talk with Greg Jenner, the wonderful Greg Jenner. Thank you for joining us this evening. It's great to have you all here. It's great to have you all as Valued Teachers Club members, of course. My name is Tesney. I'm joining you from Stadler Teachers Club. And I just have a few things to remind you before we get started. So don't forget, as Stadler Teachers Club members, you guys get 30% off WH Smith online at WH Smith online. And that's off all Stadler products which is a fantastic deal and um, because everyone loves some new stationery and also even better than discounted stationery don't forget to use the hashtag and um, teacher talk 2022 on social media throughout this session and tag and um, stadler teachers club on twitter and facebook as we will be entering those who do use the hashtag into a prize draw to win some free stationery i myself love free stationery and i'm sure you do too so you'll be getting a stadler and um, stationery bundle through the post and um, for using that hashtag on social media again it's great to have you with us just one little ground rule before we get going we're going to be using the q a function Rather than the chat function today, the Q&A function just means that myself and Greg can keep an eye on any questions that we have coming through. So if you do have any questions or any issues related to the Zoom, please let me know and I'll be able to address it then. But anything else related to tonight's discussion, Greg, of course, will be answering it. Don't worry also if you have to shoot off and um, we're hoping to be sharing this, the link to this recorded Zoom um, with yourselves after the talk, surely later on this week. And um, so you'll be able to rewatch it. Don't panic if you miss something, if you forget to write anything useful down and um, you'll be able to catch up. As I promised, I'm not gonna keep you too long now. That's enough of my face and my voice. I'm just gonna play a very, very quick video, super cute video. And um, for those of you that haven't joined us for a teacher talk before, this will be your first look. Only our teacher talk um, attendees have seen this video. We haven't even shared it across our socials yet. And we're really excited to hear your feedback about it. So please feel free to pop a little message in the Q&A section if you enjoyed it. And then once that video has been played, I will then be passing you on to Greg, um, which is really, really exciting. So bear with me one moment whilst we get our video up. I definitely would have been the one to rip my name badge. And as I said, super, super cute. Just in case you didn't know, as it says on the screen at the moment, we are celebrating our 10 years of Teachers Club, which is just fantastic. Hence our Teacher Talk events. And we're really, really looking forward to this one. We, of course, have got one coming up next week as well with Michael and Angelica Bell, and Michael Underwood and Angelica Bell, which is really, really exciting. So do make sure that you sign up for that. For the time being, that's enough from me. I'm going to hand over to Greg. Greg, it's over to you. I'm going to turn my camera off but I will be present just in case anyone has any questions um, and we look forward to the rest of the discussion thank you so much thank you very much uh what a lovely introduction uh hello everyone um I am <laughs> feel like I'm I've been overhyped in that um I don't think a talk is quite what I'm planning doing it I'm interested in having more of a discussion more of a conversation um, speaking with you about what it is we all common and what we might be able to learn from each other, um, myself from you, as well as perhaps you from some of the stuff I do. Um, I don't tend to like doing talks where I impart, impart wisdom because I don't think I have much. Um, I am someone who, who has a lovely job and I get to work on fun things, but I have uh, a doubt filled at communicating than I am. So I thought tonight really would be more of a sharing session between all of us. And if you've got any questions at any points, just please use the Q&A and, um, and ask me stuff uh, whenever it occurs to you, because I don't really have a, a kind of thing I'm going to tell you and you sort of sit quietly. That's not what I'm looking to do. here. I'm genuinely interested in what we can all 
um, share between ourselves and what we might find is perhaps in surprise or intriguing or if there are any things that you haven't pondered or things I haven't pondered that I can learn from you. Um, but I guess a very quick introduction kind of stuff I, I do. Um, I'm a public means that my job is geared towards the audience always. I'm always thinking about the audience and what do they need? What do they want? What level of knowledge that they already have when it comes to history? Um, of course, with children, that level of knowledge is often pretty low and sometimes it's remarkably good. Uh, it depends on the child. It depends on how old they are. It depends on so, um, Sunday at Cheltenham Book Festival uh, with 500 kids in the audience and um, some of the kids were very knowledgeable and some of them were you know um, excited and curious I think to, to think about history for some of the you know examples perhaps they hadn't done much at all so as a public historian I'm always trying to bear in mind who I'm speaking with and, and I with rather than to think history more as a conversation even though primarily I'm broadcasting at people you know I'm, I'm the one with the fancy microphone um, and I'm the one who writes books and I'm the one who you know makes tv shows or podcasts but um, I think the, the power really of getting people to to enjoy or switch on to history is to avoid the kind of classic patronizing tone the condensation uh, that's not a word condensation um, of power dynamic saying i know everything you shut up you sit there um i i find it much more interesting to work with what people are naturally interested in to see where their curiosity comes from to try and calibrate what i'm doing towards their interests and obviously in a room full of they're all going to be different they won't all have something in common um but then again they do have something in common. They're all human beings, children. They all live in the same country, perhaps the same, watch the same TV show. So broadly speaking, I'm always trying to find the commonalities that work broadly and generally and uh, inclusively. But at the same time, there can be really useful moments where you spot a, a tiny little chink in the armor and go, ah, ha, ha, that's, that's the way in for you, for this particular person sat in front of you. I'm sure all of you do that as teachers. I'm sure that's exactly the kind of thing that you're highly skilled in. But in terms of what it is I do, as a public historian, I'm always doing two simultaneous things that feel slightly oppositional. On the one hand, you're trying to find something that's going to connect to the individual. That one child who's watching TV or listening to the radio or reading a book or sat in you're hoping to have that direct communication with that one person and for them to feel that shared curiosity and excitement at the wonder of the past and to think, oh, wow, okay, well, okay, this this sounds good. Tell me more. In time, I'm often speaking to large groups of children, large groups of people. You know, when it's if it's a book talk, it's probably several hundred. When it's a radio program, you're in the 200, 300 thousands for the podcast. When it's on Radio 4, you know, we were up to 1.5 million people listening at the time book it's you know tens of thousands so every time uh, each project has its own audience that audience is often very different in scale and size than the previous project so a lot of what I'm doing is specifically targeted to what is the project in which case what is the audience so if it's a room if it's a view I find proximity to be really important and I mean physical proximity I mean get close and saying hello and coming down off the stage when I'm allowed to. So on Sunday, I um, was doing my book talk and having a nice fun time. I've just written, it took me three years to write. And, um, and it's a sort of fun illustrated history of daily life uh, through 50 objects a child might use every day. And I can probably shut in and see what happens. Uh, oh, no, I'm not allowed to do screen sharing. So Tesney might need to. Uh, I will um, let you screen share now. If thank you. you. One second. Um, thank you. There you go. Yep. Am I, am I being. OK, there we go. For me. Um, so 
it's just the book talk I was doing. The book is called You Are History. To that and a little bit about what I mean by you are history. It obviously, you know, typically that phrase is a more of an insult. You know, your history is more of a threat. But I wanted it to be much more of an inclusive offer. But you can see in the book, I am doing 50 objects um, that a child will use probably most days of their life. Uh, and it's actually designed around the assumption being that most children do go to school. Obviously, there are homeschooled children. There are those who, who aren't in the formal schooling environment. But And I went through my talk and rattled through it. And it's got, you know, silly jokes and, and information and things like that. And this is Plato's uh, ancient alarm clock from 2,400 years ago and a clepsydra, which is a water clock. Um, and I use sort of quiz elements to get people to put their hands up and guess. And I'm sure you do a huge amount of that in your lessons, but that's, it's a really fun environment when you're doing it in front of a big, because if you hold it long enough, you start to get momentum where everyone starts shouting and everyone's getting involved. And the longer you hold it, the more people get excited. And I try where possible to take as many of those answers and, you know, uh, respond to them directly. So if a kid yells you know, 100, I go 100. 100 you know so you just sort of roll it and get the room coming um this by the way is a medieval fire clock so this is a chinese time telling device uh that let the time um so the joke would be you know normally you tell the time in china you could smell the time uh every hour you get a different incense so you walk into a room and 4 p.m smells different to 3 p.m so it's a brilliant idea and very exciting for kids because it's a conceptual surprise of them they they understand time they understand how to tell the time but little technique from a different part of the world where time could be experienced in a um sensory way that they probably haven't thought about so i sometimes try to beyond in my work to get kids to sort of go oh okay isn't exactly like my life there are other ways to to live one's life and so the book is looking at things that are ordinary so this is a seat from the bronze age uh ancient in fact um obviously toilets are funny um i'm sure you've discovered that but you know given my work as a historian who uses humor it's our um, and so here I'm working on the idea that Roman foricae, which is the public toilets, have no privacy. They have no cubicles. So you're just sitting next to a stranger and you're sharing your, your zillow spongion, which means your sponge on a stick and you're you know, passing it to a stranger and wiping. That's sort of gross. And the innate threat of the fact that if you went to public toilets in ancient Rome by rats, they would nibble at your feet. And also there were explosions because the gas that would build up in the sewers would sometimes ignore literally be burned on the bottom from their toilet so there's you can see all these sort of all these jokes all these um all these sort of elements these three slides here are working on the notion that, that the past was different that the romans would sense of privacy was different but the chinese were different uh, in, in the medieval world with how they experienced time because they smelled it so this is the notion that the past is foreign it's alien it's not like our own world um that produces laughter, it produces surprise and shock. You can hear the whole room go, ah, because they haven't thought of this before. Children haven't conceptualized this notion before that going to the loo could be dangerous, you could be blown up, that you could be attacked by rats. Um, so that is one aspect of what I'm doing, where it's come from the, the kind of the abstract foreignness of the past being a shock and surprising and and um, destabilizing to how we think of things, how we think of the normal. So this book, You Are History, um, actually is an adaptation of my first book for, for adults, which I wrote a few years ago called A Million Years in a Day. That was about the history of daily life since the Stone Age. And that was 12 chapters. Each chapter was a different subject. And I wanted it to be more about items, uh, physical things, uh, stuff they do. And 50 feels like a good number. And it's beautifully illustrated by Jenny Taylor. I wanted children to be able to flick through and find something that connects to them. So when you're writing for adults, you know, most adults will opt into a book and they're happy to start at the beginning and move through to the end. 
with a child, they may not want to start at the very beginning and then progress through systematically page one, page two, page three. That, you know, that's that's very a bit dry and dusty. They might get bored on page six. So I like the idea of a book that functions on every single page, regardless of where you start. You can flick to page uh, 63 and start there and say, oh, shoes are 10,500 years old. These are uh, Stone Age shoes from um, uh, Oregon in, in the USA. It's Americans way back in the start on that page, and it makes sense. So the book is designed to be fun and, and colorful and illustrative, but it's also designed to be to give children the uh, agency to choose which of these histories do they want to learn first. And the hope is, of course, that if they start by um, sort of flicking to page 36 and it's the history of chocolate uh, or the history of mashed potato, you know, the history of potatoes, for example. Oh, hang on, this book's fun. It's interesting. I'm surprised. I've learned something I didn't know. Maybe I'll try something else in the book. So the hope is that you lure them in, <laughs> um, you, you engage with them on, they feel comfortable with, and if they come to trust you, come to trust the style, come to trust the, the visuals, the jokes, the, the, the sort of delight of learning something new, or willing to then engage with something else that is, you know, typically they wouldn't necessarily switch on to. They wouldn't necessarily go, oh, yeah, this is for me. So the idea of You Are History is that, as I said, it's a book that is universal and it's also specific. It's meant to be the most, pos most generic book of all in terms of accessibility. Every child in the UK should be able to read this book and find something in it that is uh, relevant to their life. Um, it should speak to them because it's the history of underpants and we all wear underpants. It's the history of washing and we all wash. It's the history of food and pen uh, books and paper and calculators, globes and uh, climbing frames and um, bikes and cars and um, jewelry and uh, you know toothbrushes and, and you know, cleaning your teeth. It's all the stuff that all of us do. So any child, regardless of their background, regardless of their heritage or faith, regardless of their competency in English, uh, the language, um, something out of it. The hope would be that every child will be different in which page they start on and which page they end on. And that's fine too. So I suppose um, in terms of what I'm trying to do in my work, I'm always trying to keep in mind the universe of trying to make everything as open and welcoming as possible, accessible to all, um, enjoyable to all, while at the same time trying to leave these breadcrumbs uh, of uh, and, and excitement for each individual child, for them to follow their own path, for them to have their own route through the labyrinth. Um, as long as they all get to the treasure at the end, there's no treasure in the labyrinth. What am I doing? That's not a, that's not a metaphor that works. Okay, sorry. Um, but the idea Every child should be able to choose their path to discovering the joy of history. It's quite a long-winded introduction, I realize. And uh, I, now actually for us to, to talk more actually. So if you have questions, um, it'll be great to start hearing from you um, and uh, to sort of see what we might learn from each other or, or what you know, issues maybe are coming up for you. Um, I mean, I can see one question here that just, just came through. How important is including comedy when discussing history? Um, well, for me, it's uh, really important. Um, what I do. So um, if you, I mean, I, if I take the, you know, okay, a fart joke. There you go. Uh, not very sophisticated. Um, but in the 16th century, uh, potato stood. Um, there was a French scientist, a Swiss scientist called Caspar Bohar, who believed potatoes caused leprosy and flatulence. Now that is a funny joke, easy enough for any child to enjoy. You know, you can you can have a fart gag whenever you need it. Um, but I would use I use humour in in a, a sort of um, in two ways really. I mean, the, the, I mean this is a very straightforward joke. This is just a visual joke that just worked in the room. Me, not me. You know, stupid, a stupid. A laugh, it's, it's a sort of what I'd call a 
it's just one where you just get a sort of sudden little ha but it doesn't really do anything historically it's not adding any information it's not helpful at all uh this is a stupid joke an aqueduct versus an aqueduct that's a joke based purely on the fact that when i talk about aqueducts sometimes children misunderstand me and they they think i've said aqueduct but aqueduct rather and so i thought it'll be funny hey, not this that um but he really important i'll stop sharing actually and we can get back to my stupid face um humor is not always appropriate it's not always um correct for the lesson or the history you're you're tackling and it takes skill and uh, experience to judge it correctly there are some subjects you've got to be really careful with and i've done this for about 15 years histories uh, a bbc tv show for, for 13 years i was the history the sketches and I wrote three songs but really my job was to be the historian and that meant providing historical information but it also sometimes meant meant being the kind of the kind of taste arbiter and sort of going ooh, let maybe we need to back off on this one and maybe be more cautious uh, comedy humor are really really powerful devices and they are extremely um they can be extremely influential in shaping a person's enjoyment of the subject, which is why I love using them. I fell in love with history through comedy. When I was you know, 14, my big radical moment really was discovering Peter Cook and Dudley Moore and Monty Python and uh, the Goon. So kind of my dad's generation of comedy. But also then I absolutely fell in love with Eddie Izzard, who for me is sort of the old comedian who had a huge impact on my personality and my sense of humor and how I express myself. Um, Eddie is fantastically clever and put all sorts of history in their show. And I really learned an awful lot from, from that. And I took a lot of that into Horrible Histories. And I wrote my master's thesis on Monty Python's Holy Grail and Arthurian literature and the link between them. So I'm intellectually interested in comedy. My PhD, which I could not afford, was going to be on Chaucerian comedy in the 13th and 14th century. Well, 14th century, I was going to look also at romance comedy, which is uh, a style of medieval comedy that's very weird and, and strange by our standards. So I am fast and I use comedy as a tool. So when I'm being silly about the past, I'm doing it on purpose because I think it's a really powerful teaching tool. I think it's a really a helpful technique. I think it brings uh, joy and uh, and the dynamics of play to a subject that can sometimes be intimidating or boring or dull or irrelevant. You know, there are many children. Well, actually, I mean, there are many ads encounter when they they might come to my book talk or they might send me an email or a tweet who say, oh, "I hated history at school. It was so boring and irrelevant. It had nothing to do with." And I only got into it when I was 40 or something. And, you know, I, I wish you'd been my teacher when I was a kid. And I always sort of, that makes me really sad because A, I'm not a teacher, you know, you, you are doing the much more important job, but also it makes me really sad that a subject of such fascination, you know, that there is nothing more interesting than history because history is the sum totality of the human experience. It's 108 billion people who have lived since the dawn of our species and all of their experiences and all the things they've done. There, there is nothing more interesting than history. It's everything, right? Um, so when people say, oh, it's boring and irrelevant and nothing to do with me, I, I ah, it's everything to do with you. History is everything. The reason you're the reason you speak the language you do, the reason the clothes you wear are a certain way, the reason your road is named a certain thing, the reason you wear certain hats on certain occasions, the reason the buildings are this tall and not that tall. History dominates every single life. We live in the shadows of our ancestors. We live in their footsteps. We live in the world that they built and we get to shape it and change. It. And then we also get to remember them and we get to choose how to remember them. And when people say to me, history is boring and irrelevant, it's really, uh, uh, it's not an indictment of teaching. But what it is, is a reminder, I think, that not everyone responds to information in the same way. Not everyone naturally can generate their own curiosity simply by, by, given, you know, by, by being given, um, here's some information about the past. So humor for me is a way of um, 
of removing the fear and elevating the information, but exploring the information like a or making it fun, giving it the kind of peaks and troughs of a joke. And jokes are really extraordinary. They have these mental anchors. They are neurologically interesting. We remember jokes. I can remember jokes I heard when I was 12 and I'm 40. I can remember songs that were, you know, when I was 15, 16, I can't remember documentaries I watched last week. You know, I've read, and there's a thousand books behind me in this office. I pretty much all of them, but I can barely remember half of them. But I remember entire Eddie Izzard. So humor is extraordinary because it actually worms its way into our brains. Punchlines function like little anchors. They sit in there and they, you can tie information to them, won't float away. So on Horrible History, the show I did for 13 years, you know, songs in this way because music and melody is so memorable and we use the jokes because it's so memorable and it's joyous and it's wonderful so i think comedy uh times sometimes they can look at they look at me and sort of go you're not taking history seriously enough and i say oh no no exact opposite the reason i use comedy is because i take history incredibly seriously i think it's the most important and that's why i use comedy because i think comedy is a brilliant tool for allowing people to enjoy a subject and discover its innate appeal and once they get into it they then go oh this is all right actually i can read a history book that doesn't have jokes and i'll still enjoy it so it's a process i think um that's a long answer isn't it sorry i'm, I'm rambling um let's see some of your questions some of your, your thoughts okay um how do you choose which historic icons to focus on for children and what tends to be most engaging well, that's a great question so um when we did homeschool history, which was a uh, an emergency podcast for the pandemic, um, we were asked to try and keep it fairly curriculum adjacent. So we moved away from the the mission statement of "You're Dead to Me," which is the podcast I do for for adults mostly, where we're trying to sort of on that show we're trying to broaden beyond what people usually know. So we were trying to reinforce and to support what the curriculum, so that they felt. And maybe they were being guided through a very difficult and stressful period, you know, very upsetting period. And of course, very difficult for teachers and parents and children that you were having to teach online. That's, you know, was no fun at all. So we chose um, people whose lives were interesting and that there's an approach that can work comedically. So Florence Nightingale, um, Mary Seacole, we looked at social history you know that's something i'm particularly keen on but we wanted it to be so we did an episode on on pompeii uh, professor mary beard on uh, on that episode but we wanted it to be about what life was like for children in pompeii um I'm, i don't know if this is going to work but uh let's let's see if i do screen sharing Ooh, risky, 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 and gamble. Let's try it. Screw. I, yeah, hang on. Let's see if I can get this working. From this terrible tragedy, the archaeologists have been able to learn much more about what life was like for ordinary Roman citizens. However, this fascinating snapshot doesn't give us a perfect window into everyday life because volcanic eruptions aren't an everyday thing. For example, found much furniture in Pompeii. Does that mean Romans didn't use furniture very much? Or had many people and evacuated when they first saw smoke coming out of the bubbling volcano? No, I don't know if you could hear that. I don't know if that came through. Um, do you want to tell me if it didn't? Let me know. Um, but just in case it didn't, um, we, we basically would cast where we were trying to explore what would it have been like to be a child in the past in Roman Pompeii and we had a little section there about the fact that actually Pompeii is an incredible resource it tells us all sorts of things about daily life but it's also not a snapshot of what reality was like this is a snapshot of a disaster which means that some of the furniture is missing ordinary life is missing because people were already panicking they were already escaping they were already packing up their stuff and and leaving um, so when we choose what we do in the past we often you know, when we, we're trying to cover people, we're looking for people who, whose lives are interesting, innately surprising, and who also maybe are, um, you know, you can learn something surprising from it. So it's, um, it, it's not just here's some information. 
it might be here's someone whose life you might have but they were they were not like you might have thought nightingale is a really interesting example right you know she's very rich she's quite posh she was very um, super intelligent she came from quite an odd background and she rebelled against her parents which children might be surprised to hear but her rebellion wasn't to go and smoke behind the bins or to do anything illegal her rebellion was to want to become a nun and to want to become a nurse and that was to her parents an in source of stress they absolutely did not want that for her they wanted her to marry with Florence Nightingale the, the angle is well how do you make this person who's very straight and stiff and proper and Victorian how do you make them human how do you make them real question that you know we, we tried to answer was well how do you make them feel like what a teenager would want to do you know a young person when they're sort of pushing against their parents and they want to find who they are well Florence uh, that was her calling was was medicine and nursing so we choose subjects based on you know interesting if they're important if they're on the curriculum but we're always trying to perspective of like what would you have done in that position how would it have been for you what differences were there um so i hope that answers your, your question there uh, i've been struggling with the areas of the curriculum that have been told that i need to cover i've been given the stone age this year i've been told that i need to teach certain facts and that children need to write an explanation text about this time in history and how to engage the children with these subjects with such constraints and those um which engaging well that's a really specific question from megan uh, thank you megan for that um I love the Stone Age. I think Stone Age, is, Stone Age is fascinating. We did an episode of homeschool history on, if you haven't heard it, um, on the British Stone Age, in fact, um, it might be worth listening to it. It's just 15 minutes. Um, do there, what we zeroed in on there specifically is, again, the commonalities. Okay, um, let me... A lot of what, my, what I'm doing in my work and, and when I work with my teams and when I work with colleagues and so on is I'm doing two oppositional things simultaneously. Okay, so there's a push and a pull. And the push is what I mentioned before, is the, the comedy of the alien, the, the humor of like, these people were different from us. They're so weird. Look at the wacky stuff they put on their bodies. Look at the things they eat. Um, so as a case in point, if you were to go on YouTube, and type in Horrible History's MasterChef, you'll see some of the compilations, I think, of some of our sketch. And uh, we have our parody, you know, Ben and Jim pretending to be the hosts of MasterChef doing their silly loud shouting. And we have on different people from history cooking. And the jokes all come from how strange cooking used to be compared to how cooking is now. Is the contrast of then and now. The modern ghosts, the modern guests, uh, you know, are like startled and the Aztec is like yeah this is perfectly normal to eat some you know swamp larvae or you know whatever so the joke comes from the foreignness the alien the unfamiliar that's where your laughter comes that's the push the pull is then to go but you have done in the past how would you have fed yourself here are the things that are available to you. Here are the pressures that are on you. Here are the problems you have to solve. You have to stay warm. You have to stay safe. You have to deal with bears outside if it's the Stone Age. You have to deal with saber-toothed tigers. You have to stay in your cave. Um, you have to finally, well, you can't grow food because you haven't yet discovered farming. So where are you getting your food? What are you going to eat? Alerts. How are you wiping your bottom? Um, are you going to wash? How often? What about you? Know, how often do you clean your teeth? You clean your teeth twice a day, right in the Stone Age. How would you clean your teeth in the Stone Age? Um, so, what we do on, on horrible histories, what I do in my books, what I do in um, the variety of my sort of projects, is I use that push and pull. You find you find your jokes. You get the you get the children to be <gasps> sort of shocked the weirdness of the past Tutankhamun was buried with 145 spare pairs of underpants that's too many pants what a crazy number of pants that's your joke but then you go yeah even a pharaoh wore underpants even a king even the most powerful man in all of Egypt who was a living god he wore pants so what were pants made of why were people wearing pants how do you keep your and so there's these sort of ordinary banal daily little moments that you can explore through the shock and you can come back around and you can find the the human element and so for me the stone age incredibly far away incredibly foreign incredibly 
unsettling and strange because it's so distant. And yet, if you look at Scarra Bray, which was our episode that we did on the on the Stone Age, Scarra Bray up in and the Orkney Islands, uh, up in um, off the coast of, of Scotland mainland, um, the homes that they lived in were really modern. In the Stone Age, they had shelving. They would have little fires they cooked their food in. They lived in communities of 100 people. Um, you know, they were, they were trying to farm. They were trying to catch fish, but they were trying to eat what they could. It's, I think, really surprising. Normal elements of our modern life, and then you drop them into a different era and say, right, compare and contrast. You know, what's so shocking? What's so weird? But you can also find those elements that feel so familiar. So... I think the thing about the Stone Age that's unfamiliar is, is how different is our modern life. You know, I'm using Wi-Fi to talk to you. I'm using a, a webcam. I'm using technology. The lights are above me, electricity. These aren't Stone Age things at all. And yet, I'm wearing knitwear. People in the Stone Age, they knitted. They had sewing needles 40,000 years ago. I'm wearing shoes right now. People in the Stone Age had shoes. I clean my teeth. Stone Age clean their teeth. You know, I've got a beard. Well, how do people groom? Uh, Ertzi the Iceman had tattoos. Why did he have tattoos? Well, he had, as far as we can tell, pain. Eve, his tattoos were linked to areas that he had um, discomfort, arthritis on his body, because when scans were done of his skeleton, they found there were elements of arthritis and the tattoos were over the sort of thing. Oh, so tattoo, perhaps medical, perhaps it was a, you know, an attempt to try and cure the pain. Perhaps it was, you know, an appeal to the gods, but it might have been an appeal to, to medicine. So the Stone Age is so far away, but it's also so easily comparable to our own lives because we do so many of the things people did back then. We have to urinate, defecate, stay warm. We'll have the company of our friends and families. We'll tell jokes. We'll tell art well they had art you know we live with animals dogs and cats you know people domesticated dogs in the stone age um all of those things so I, I, that's a long answer i'm sorry if I've, I've taken too long but i i think you'll find that the stone age actually you can do so much on it that feels um relevant to what children might do um boring curriculum question alert one of the things we have to teach particularly in y1 and y2 is timelines and sequencing if sequencing sorry not sequencing it's sort a of timeline great fire of london but young children struggle to grasp time and how long ago something was yeah okay is it okay that they just sequence on a timeline without really understanding the time aspect how do you suppose we allow children to understand time and dates that's a real question and something we don't do in horrible history very much okay the horrible histories the first five series um we were a broken sketch show which means we bounce around all over the place we don't do these sequentials and then from series six onwards we've done much more thematic episodes and much more of a continue we do biography through now timelines i think are really interesting when i started on horrible histories i actually did a timeline for our writers because i realized they didn't know the order of the eras you know these were very clever people some of them had been to oxford and cambridge but when i said to them where is the tudors compared to the stuarts compared to the vikings compared to the aztecs they were all over the place so timelines are a very arbitrary invention they're not huge for but they are a useful mental sort of um kind of coat hook you can just sort of hang i think it's really useful with timelines is i think you can actually do you can do little moments that matter where either with technology or the history of medicine or the history of fashion where you can sometimes then explain time moving forward that a child will make sense of so you might for example look at the history of fashion in the 14th century changes in the 15th and 16th century in the 16th century fashion becomes huge massive roughs big big dresses henry VIII and his the fashion is enormous and peacocking and then you go to the 16th century and it starts to shrink back down again the 17th century it's extremely elegant 18th century it's very simple um and so you might be able to chart one thing through a few centuries way of explaining change and continuity and transition but i don't think it's super important for children to have those um temporal time-based rules about this then this then this then this i think if you give kids an opportunity to to be able to consult a timeline they might be able to find ways of ordering that information in their heads but i would much you know maybe i'm wrong here but i'd much rather give children a joy of learning history 
give them an opportunity to celebrate the subject, to be surprised and delighted. Just give them the information and allow them to think conceptually about the And then gradually over time, they might start to piece it together and you might be able to help them to piece it together. But I don't think chronology is that important for a young child. I think that comes later. I, I think it's better to to find the find the surprise and curiosity that to me is is so important empathy of the past to be to truly study history is to empathize with how humans were and how they think differently to us because that can help build empathy with how humans are people in our lives who aren't like us they think differently they worship different gods they eat different things they have different ethical values to study the past is to build empathy so I don't think chronology is super, super important. And if you're trying to build that in aspect that you can track through, perhaps technology, perhaps medicine, uh, that would be my, my advice, I suppose. Um, we've got lots of questions and I need to speed up, I know. So let me, let me go a little quicker, okay. Um, uh, firstly, horrible histories of both TV show and books will really spark my love of history. That's, that's lovely to hear. Um, secondly, I'm in my teacher training four weeks in. Okay, do you have any suggestion of how to improve engagement amongst students, particularly lower students that just aren't concerned with the subject? Thank you. Yeah, that's a, that's a huge issue, isn't it? How do you get someone switched on to something that they don't, it doesn't feel like it's relevant to them? I think personally, uh, you know, I don't want to speak on behalf of, of you because you're, you're dealing with, with young people who, who need that direct um, connection. And I, I don't do that in my work. I speak to big crowds or large audiences. Uh, I don't do one-on-one -on -one stuff. But I think absolutely every child will care about something. So I would argue that if you can find what that child cares about, it might not be in the curriculum, but if you can find something that they're gonna, they're gonna hook onto, then give them that history. So is it football? Is it shopping? Is it hip hop music? video games is it shoes everything on the planet has a history you know in my book i talk about the history of video games and how back they go um the history of shoes really fascinating the history of shopping anything history formula one cookery doesn't matter everything so if you're struggling to find a way in through the curriculum try going in not through the curriculum initially and find something else that they're into um, and if, yeah, if they're a big fan of, you know, Lionel Messi or Ronaldo, or whatever, try and explain to them that the history of football starts in a really odd place. It's violence. It starts with huge, you know, people beating, you know, living daylights out of each other, carrying knives. Uh, and that the game in the 19th century was, was amateur ball and all those sort of things. So I, I think find a history that matters to that child and then you to spur their curiosity and then maybe you can pull them back into the curriculum would be my uh, my advice. Now obviously that comes from not not having taught. So you know apologies if that's not useful to you but I I feel like everyone excited by something is my hope. Um, a question from Luke. How would you make lessons uh, on chronology interesting, exciting, funny and more importantly memorable? We have to teach it but it seems very dry. Uh, my, I'm hoping might well be a kind of chaotic history. Uh, I love the idea of celebrating history by sort of going, well, look, it's absolute constant transition and change and revolution and mess and no one knowing what's happening next. And remember what Brexit was like. Remember, well, look what's happening right now in the, in the UK. No one knows what's coming tomorrow. No one knows what's coming next. And I think perhaps you can work with that. You can work with how every society in history was desperately trying to figure out what's happening. And then they had to deal with a pandemic, a plague, uh, you know, a war, climate change. They were always having to adapt to things and make sense of, of ugh, new things. So I think chronology, you can actually reframe to be not just this, then this, then this, then this, because that's boring, but it can actually be disaster after disaster or problem after problem or exciting revolution after a revolution yeah what you know, why is this changed oh because enough people have decided that things have to change that suddenly this has happened and this has spun off oh they've invented soap oh wow okay amazing so i think i think you can make something perhaps more of those those moments of and use those as pivot points to then explain what happens next it knows what's happened you know coming next you know world war ii in 1940 no one knew what was happening next and no one knew the west or uk or whatever you want to call it was in the war 
Um, even in 1944, there was still doubt. There were still, you know, there were rockets coming in, landing and blowing up cities. So um, it's very, everything in history was inevitable. And actually that's the biggest problem of all. Nothing in history is inevitable. Everything is chaos. So maybe embrace the chaos. Um, next question from Cheryl. There is a large push on remembering. Do you think that remembering dates, facts and figures is important for children? Or would you prioritize an understanding of narrative relationships and chronology? Yeah, facts and figures are, you know, sure, bread and butter for historians, but I, I don't care about facts and figures. Understanding the experiences past and the lives that they lived and the societies they lived in and the rules what were they not allowed to do what were they allowed to do if they were a woman in ancient Greece you weren't allowed to leave your house why if you were a woman in the 19th century and you got on a bicycle men might shout at you why uh, what aspects of the society were going to impinge on someone's freedom and were going to shape how they thought about the world what they thought of what they were excited by what they were hoping for i think it's much more important to humanity uh, it is to understand 1066 1215 you know 1381 all the kind of key dates that you know the curriculum perhaps pushes and dates can be helpful sometimes but i think it's i think it's ex exciting to remind people of the humanity um, so, uh, so that would be my answer to that. A uh, question from Elspeth. Um, hey, um, is there going to be more homeschool history? My class adore it. And well, thank you so much for listening. I'm afraid it was only for the pandemic. The BBC don't want any more. Um, but if you enjoy that sort of um, that style, my my new children's book. I, I've recorded the audio book, and it will be many hours long, and it will have all the kind of silly voices and sound effects. So you might find that 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 feels like a comparable thing you can perhaps use. Um, so apologies, no more homeschool history. But we do do radio edits if you're dead to me. Have all the swearing and naughty bits removed, and they are sometimes appropriate for children. They can be a little bit sophisticated, but they they won't be too uh, awkward. Um, so maybe have a listen to some of the radio edits, and you might find there's some some things there that work for you. Um, not an education question. What was the best thing about working on horrible histories? Oh, um, the impact. I mean, it was joyous and and uh, and exhausting breakdown after five years. Uh, but it's it's the legacy of it. It's the best thing I'll ever do. I mean, I can live to a hundred, and I'll never do anything better. Uh, I get to teach uh, undergraduate and master students now at York University and Royal Holloway University, who grew up on the show. And when I, you know, say who here, you know, watched horrible histories as a kid, just two hundred hands go up and there is nothing better in the world than being a historian and seeing the impact that's had and, um, with history through comedy when I was there and to see a generation fall in love with history because of a show that I helped make along with many, many colleagues, amazingly talented people. It's the best thing ever. It is absolutely wonderful. And um, I remember being on a, a tube train in London and across from me, six years old and, and his mum and uh, and he just started singing I took the throne of England just because I was Protestant and the mum went oh not again and it just made me because this there was a six-year-old kid who knew that George the first was a German Protestant king which never would have happened ordinarily that was the power of a song from horrible history so yeah it is a wonderful privilege to have been involved and I I love it so much um in a world where curriculum, this is an anonymous question. In a world where curriculum expectations feel nearly impossible and teachers are super stressed, I'm really about meeting crazy targets in reading, writing, math, etc. Thinks that history is an important subject that's worth investing time in. Well, I think I maybe have answered this already, but very quickly I'll reiterate. I think it's about empathy. Um, to study history is to study people in their myriad ways and all the ways that we're doing, how societies differ how society changes how people around the world were different you know many of the children in your classrooms i'm sure will perhaps have family heritages that start somewhere else you know there there will of course be british born children but they'll be to uh, immigrants born to refugees born to families that moved here in the 50s 60s and 70s but for whom their history has a broader context i'm the same i'm half french i grew up aware that history was different in France and that Agincourt was a minor skirmish that didn't matter who um, was a minor skirmish that didn't matter um, and there will be many children for whom is 
Ghanaian or uh, Pakistani or um, from China. And uh, history for them is a much more connected up story of global interactions of empire and all sorts of things. To, to study history is to understand what it is to be a citizen, what it is to be part of a big complex society that's always changing, and it will help children empathize with others because they'll be thinking about how would my life have been different in the past if I were in a different situation, and they might then look to a friend or a stranger street and go, oh your life's different from my life, oh have something in common. So I think it's a wonderful subject for that, and I, I hope that that's something you can use to convince those who maybe aren't quite so convinced yet. A uh, question from Sally. How will you make the more complex things such as Roman Republic? Uh, yeah, there are hard things in history. There are really difficult things in history. So I think you have to break them down. You know, the comedy can come from power dynamics, right? You can, you can do jokes about powerful people bossing people around. You can do jokes about bullies. You can do jokes about ordinary people being trodden on and getting ignored. You know, you can have humor from the way in which people often fall into different groups and they might, you know, come up a butt against each other and all that sort of thing. I mean, systems are boring, no systems, but politics is about people. And so I think you easily can, can reconfigure your lessons that have to be about, you know, institutions. To how is it that the ancient Greeks invented democracy, which on the face of it is about everyone getting a say, but hang on a minute, women don't get a say, and foreigners don't get a say, and the enslaved don't get a say, and people who don't have land don't get a say, and anyone who doesn't have any money doesn't get a say, and actually if you have to, you know, if you want to have a say, you need to be able to read and write. Hang on a minute, no one's getting a say except these guys. You can really, you can make your shock and surprise by dismantling an idea. Well, how has it ended up, how has this system been built? Who's benefiting? Who's losing out? I think you can apply that sort of this maybe to make the boring and the complex and the rigid, you can explain how they came to be and why in which they were allowed to, to persist, I think, I hope. Um, and uh, Megan, oh, oh, thank you, Megan. That's very kind. Thank you very much. Um, uh, and uh, I've answered the previous question. Okay, that's, that's useful. Good. Uh, Luke, I thought by those writing our curriculum. Yeah, I mean, I once debated Michael Gove on the radio about this and um, I don't know. I mean, chronology is interesting, right? Chronology is important in some ways, it, it's helpful. Um, but the study of history should also be the study of doubt, the study of absence of evidence. It should be the study of like, we don't know. You know, that what I said earlier about Pompeii. Pompeii is the most phenomenal archaeological site. You can walk around it and go, Roman roads were this wide. Roman bread looked like this. Romans were this tall because buildings were this color because there it is. And yet at the same time, we have so many questions about Pompeii. How many people lived there? We don't know. Uh, how old were they? Oh, you don't know. What were lives like for children? We don't really know. Um, what happened when the volcano first erupted? Did people stay or did they run? We don't know. So we have all these questions and questions are fundamental to history. So, yeah, I think it's I think it's really exciting to sure use chronology when it's important, but also it's really exciting to say to kids, imagine you're a history detective. Here's the evidence you got. Try and assemble the true crime podcast. Try and put and based on these types of evidence, because that's what we get tiny scraps of evidence and we try and build a bigger picture from these tiny little moments and we're often probably wrong but that's exciting it's exciting to know you might be wrong but you're doing your best so i would celebrate the fact that history is often about the story and the doubt and actually the best historians are the ones who admit that sometimes new information comes along that shoots your idea out the water you know you're, you're wrong you're wrong you wrote a book about it but you're wrong there's new evidence now um Okay, uh, Kim asks, at our school, I've encouraged the phrase history is where you stand. I feel it's very important for children to learn, understand history in their local area. Would you agree? I think that's fantastic, Kim. Yes, absolutely. Local history is so crucial because microscopic, the small is so much more approachable and accessible and makes more sense to a child. If they can walk around and see it and feel it and, uh, you know, the name of their road, you know, I live in a road named after a very famous general in the Crimean War. And around the corner is a, you know, another Crimean War hero, and around the corner is another one, okay? And there are who don't even know what the Crimean War is. But when I saw that road, I went, aha, what's happening here? Um, 
But to take a child to your local archives, for example, you know, to, um, my wife works in, and, you know, the archives are really, they're great, they're free, they're open. Um, they do sessions, they do, um, you know, work, uh, workbooks, and they can get maps out. You know, maps are fantastic for kids. Get out a local area map and chart the differences. Show them how it used to be. Show them what happened when the railway line was first built. Um, the canals, you know, why are they building canals? Why are they building roads? Who's building them? What for? What happens when you build a road? Do people come? Do they leave? Um, local history is amazing for that because it gives you an understanding of a bigger society through some sea right in front of them and of their life, I think. So yeah, brilliant. Good idea, Kim. Uh, Lucy, what can I do to support a student who's obsessed with history? Oh, they sound good. I just don't have enough knowledge to, uh, to satiate her. I love her passion, but history is not my speci speciality. Wish it was. Well, that's okay, Lucy. Don't you worry. There are plenty of historians out there who will happily provide more. I mean, obviously, um, there are great, great books out there. There are great podcasts out there. There are video games. There are YouTube series. I mean, some of this stuff is a bit dodgy. You have to be a little bit careful. Golden age where there's so much freely available or cheaply available you know my books are in libraries so if your if your class can't afford new books all the time no problem at all just borrow my books from libraries you know i i love but there are amazing historians out there who love to share their knowledge so if, you, if you're on a curriculum you know, trying to teach something and and your student is out foxing you with questions i guarantee you if you send a books now i bet you they get back to you with suggestions um there is an amazing community of historians who love to help and uh, you'll be surprised perhaps how much there is online so yeah honestly look for it it'll probably be there um any other questions thank you so much for all your thoughts okay i mean i've i'm very happy to stay uh, i know seven is when we're probably going to stop but i am really really happy to keep talking so um if by all means please do um i've got one question here person thanks for answering my question about convincing colleagues <laughs> good uh, we have a high percentage of children from different countries so i'll definitely share your thoughts about how important yeah i mean that's the other thing right we live in a connected globalized world so when people talk about british history well british history is global history because it i mean you know empire sure obvious question right you know so the raj um the east india company the way in which we got involved in china involved inverted commas um our impact on north america impact on the slave trade the, the horrors of the slave trade and what that was but also the impact of the royal navy and how far it's what it was doing australia new zealand um you know we british history is global history and 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 that's from a, but also all history is global history you know when your when your um pupils are sitting in the canteen maybe or maybe they're you know maybe they've brought in lunch in a in tupperware they're going to be eating foods from somewhere else on the planet that to them are normal but were radical exciting discoveries you know potatoes after 1492 tomatoes 1492 turkey 1492 um beans 1492 um chocolate chilies 1492 um there are there are no chilies in india until the 1560s there are no tomatoes in italian 30s potatoes aren't popular until the fifth no uh 1780s in fact thanks to parmentier so many of the foods that are normal now and expected now have a history from around the world so the history of food is a wonderful way to do global history uh, because it gets you into trade, exchange, war, empire, conflict, medicine. You know, foods were medicines. Um, you know, sugar was a medicine in the Arabic, in the Arab world, in the Persian world, um, before it was a delicious treat. So, the history of medicine is a way to do chronology, because we spoke about that earlier. It's a wonderful way to do food histories. It's a wonderful way to do history. It's a great way to do local history. Um, you know, you can look at the history of local shops in the high street. You can look at, um, you know, the 19th century. You know, a lot of Italians come in and start selling ice creams. They're called penny licks. And, um, you know, there's amazing way, you know, we can look at uh, fish, or the, the history of fish and chips even, you know, which is a dish, right? It comes from, from sort of Northern Europe. Um, the sandwich, um, the idea of rum and the Royal Navy, uh, the idea of gin, uh, where that comes from, the, you know, there's all these there's all these incredible histories so 
I would say that food history and medicine are amazing portals to every history is global history and global history is British history. So I don't think you zero in on little specifics. I think you can celebrate everything and you can take a small thing and you can make it really big. Um, and you can take a big thing and make it really small. It's, you know, that, that's, you know, if you listen to some of my podcasts, hopefully you can see that, you know, we've done episodes on the history of high heel shoes. We've done episodes on the history of timekeeping. And you might be thinking, timekeeping, that's so niche. No, the history of timekeeping is the history of the war, technology, history of politics, the history of empire, the history of how we understand the cosmos and religion and theology and prayer and lunch. The history of timekeeping is literally so important to our daily lives. And that's one of my favorite ever episodes because we've got incredible feedback from people going, I had no idea that the history of clocks was so enormous. And you go, yeah, it's everything. It's everything. It's how we regulate time. So history... Everywhere you look, and there are problems in the way that we have to teach history because actually we are taught all sort of, you know, linear, chronology, small, in a box, yada, yada, yada. But history is the study of everything, and you can take any perspective. And if you've got a pupil who's excited, run with it. And if you've got a pupil who's not excited, try and gear it towards what they care about because that pupil will find a way into the subject so long as you can find something that connects to them, something for them. Even if it's the history of video games, great, go with it. History of video games is great and you can use that back into board age. Senate played in ancient Babylon and Egypt. So, or, or chess, you know, the history of chess, uh, which is a Persian word meaning king. Um, so I think, you know, I feel like I've, I've sort of rambled a lot and I apologize if I'm sort of slightly chaotic here, but my my hope is that if you can, that you'll see that history is a sort of enormous flowing river and you can sort of take a cup and dip it in and pull out and it will feel exciting because you've dipped in like this cup of knowledge out from this vast, vast sort of Amazonian river and you can keep dipping and keep dipping and you're always going to get something else, but it's always the same river. So yeah, to study the past is helpful, it's useful, it helps us understand our own society. It might even help us figure out the future. It will help children be better citizens, but it's also thrilling and experience and to be surprised and to be empathetic to how other people think and, uh, and act and what matters to them. Um, so yeah, I mean, that, you know, that's my sort of philosophy really. Um, Okay, we've got another couple of questions. I'm currently building lessons for my year seven class in pre the Neolithic period onwards. Are there any particular elements of these ages you believe may lend themselves to increase opportunities for children to enjoy their lessons? With the Islamic world, as my school is 90% Muslim and, and relating their culture peaks attention often. Yeah, right. Okay, that's really interesting, right? So obviously Islam dates to uh, much later on. Islam's uh, heritage is, is more sort of eighth century. Um, but or, or late seventh century, but um, but the Middle East is where like so much stuff. Period. The Middle East is where bread was first invented. Uh, the Middle East is where farming was first invented. Uh, the Middle East is where we have some incredible uh, evidence of people domesticating foxes and keeping them as pets, and um, the building of the first and earliest city, Ur uh, and Uruk. Um, and similarly, if you have uh, many children who are Muslim, they might be really interested in the history of uh, very, very early Bronze Age civilizations, maybe the, the Indus, sometimes known as the Harappans. Um, sophisticated they were, the, 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 you know, the cities they built, the, um, the water um, systems. Um, but the, the Middle East, uh, I guess, in many ways is where so much change and transition happened in the Stone Age, particularly bread, actually, really, really interesting. Uh, and farming is so important. So um, you might find, uh, I did an episode of Your Dead to Me about Chateau Hoyuk, which is the oldest town, and they might be surprised stuff in that. Um, obviously, and then when you come into Islam, you know, when you're talking about the, the kind of the, the, the rise of Islam as a faith and as a, as a sort of important um, political 
movement, you can look at the sort of the science. You can look at the, the House of Wisdom, which was this incredible um, education or library in Iraq in the sort of ninth century. And the science being done by brilliant um, Arab and Persian astronomers and philosophers and poets um you know the earliest evidence we have for hay fever comes from a 10th century islamic scholar who was sort of like people are sneezing when the rose bushes you know are, are around about and we have you know um people like ibn there as he's called in medieval latin um um uh, ibn al haytam who is a phenomenally brilliant man who's exploring how light works and and um and op uh, optics the science of optics and he's interested in what happens when you play music to an animal does it walk faster if you play music to a camel will the camel or not which means you know our animal influenced by music and external stimuli which gets you into a question of do animals have souls you know there's amazing stuff happening in the world and the persian world in the middle ages as well so there's tons of new scholarship on on that as well so if your children are not necessarily you know white british kids who uh, go to a c of e school or a catholic school or whatever there's still tons of history you can offer them that will um connect them back to maybe their family heritage and might explain some of the world and you can still build into the curriculum i'm sure um because i can you're passionate about history i am i'm very nerdy um i'm glad that it's it's really very kind of you and um and i have to go and leave the session but thank you so much thank you okay it's brilliant thank you very much well i mean you know i've really really enjoyed talking to you uh, i've got a few minutes left if you if you want to ask anything at all but if not i mean um go check out i guess some of my work but um you know you can yeah you can find my book is out in two weeks you are history but the children's podcast homeschool history i shot um, video any a horrible histories find series available at the moment and they're filming series 10 and 11 right now um wonderful other books out there so uh i can see tesney has reappeared which means i am i need to shut up but um uh, but yeah you know, I, I hope this has been useful for you. And thank you very much for your questions. Uh, they've been really, really um, thoughtful and, and really interesting for me to, to think about. So thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much, Greg. And um, that was fantastic. Perfect. I know so I, I've learned so much. And to be honest with you, even as someone who used to watch horrible histories myself as a young child, I can hear the songs in my head now as you've been speaking about it. So I'm sure many of our teachers club <laughs> members appreciate and feel the exact same way. Um, and it's been really, really great to see so much fantastic feedback from our members. And again, I can't thank you enough for joining us this evening. Um, if you do want to share anything with us, we're more than happy to then share them with our members. But for all of our members, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, it's been fantastic to have you here just a few quick reminders don't forget you can get that 30 percent off and um, that exclusive 30 percent discount off stadler products at whsmith.co.uk just head to the um, teachers club website and log into the membership section to claim your unique code again i can see a few have been a few of you have been using the hashtag on social media thank you that's great to see you all engaging and um, please do feel free to share some feedback with us you can email myself tweet it share it tag myself tag greg this has been absolutely fantastic and really really useful for all of our teachers club members um, and i'm sure that they'll be using all of the information you shared as they move forward into the classroom over the next few days greg thank you so much for joining um, and it's been fantastic to have you all here i won't keep you all for too long because i know that you're all probably itching to go make some dinner i know i am but uh, <laughs> thank you so much for joining us and we look forward to hopefully seeing a lot of you at our next teacher talk next week with um Ange with angelica bell and michael underwood greg thank you once again Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye all. Cheers. Bye.